earlier phones were already used for electric telegraph. That means that the earphones predated the microphone by the considerable number of years. Take a look at the gramophone. This is one of the early loudspeakers and the Paulsen's telegraphone, which is used as an earphone. So that's two different types of electrical to audio transducers. Of the two tasks of changing electrical to audio signal, the task of the earphone is much simpler compared to a loud speaker. The earphone can use a very small diaphragm, which is usually placed in inside of our ear, and ensure that the sound waves from this diaphragm are coupled directly to the ear cavity. The power that is required is in the low milliwatt level. And even a few milliwatts can produce considerable pressure amplitude at the eardrum. Often more than is safe for the hearing. The conditions of use are, in other words, strictly defined, and the designer can concentrate on reducing resonances and increasing linearity in the certain knowledge that the effect will be noticeable. Unlike loudspeaker, a loudspeaker is not used pressed against the ear. It is used in a large room or a large theater so that the sound waves will be launched into a space whose property are unknown. It could have a concrete wall or a wood wall or any material. So different materials will act differently when applied with sound waves. So that's the main challenge for loudspeaker designer. The transducer of a loudspeaker system is sometimes termed as pressure unit and its task is to transform an electrical wave which can be of a very complex shape into an air pressure wave of the same wave form. So to achieve this electrical to audio um, conversion, we will still be using the diaphragm that we used in microphone. We can say that a microphone can be used as a speaker and a speaker can be used as microphone because they have the same design and the same process behind their operation. Only we are going to reverse the input and the output. So practically every material known has been used for loudspeaker diaphragm at some time. From the classic varnished paper to titanium alloy and carbon fiber. And almost every shape variations of the traditional cone has been used. So commonly, this is the construction of a loudspeaker. And the thing that moves or that produces the audio output is the diaphragm which is commonly um, shaped as a cone but there is a problem um, when using um, cone diaphragm it is prone to breaking up so if the cone is to be able to handle low frequencies it must have a large area at high frequencies however there will be waves on the cone itself so that different parts of the cone move in different directions. For example, this is the cone diaphragm. So for low frequencies, the application of the frequency into the diaphragm is not as a whole. So for example, the low frequency is applied here. That means it will uh, vibrate all throughout the diaphragm and thus creating a ripple effect. And this is a problem since um, the output audio of the diaphragm should be one and whole. 
Now, to address this type of problem for low frequencies, the use of different driver units for different range of frequencies is being done. So, the range of frequencies are divided into three. We have the um, high, we have the low, and we have the uh, mid um, frequency range. So, the speakers that are at the high frequency range are called the tweeter. So, right here are the high frequency range, the mid frequency range for the mid range speaker, and the low frequency range is termed as woofers. And woofers are usually big because uh, that's the sign of the diaphragm to, to cover the low frequency range. Now let's discuss the different types of sensors being used to convert electrical to audio. As I've said earlier, the concept that is being discussed on the microphones are the same concepts that are used in converting electrical to audio. The first type is the moving iron transducer. The first type of earphone as applied to the early telephones was a moving iron type and this principle has been extensively used ever since. As applied to the telephone, the earphone uses a magnetized metal diaphragm. This is the construction of the moving iron. This is the diaphragm which is made up of a magnetized iron and this um, leads of a coil is to the input, to the electrical input of uh, the um, speaker system. So whenever there is an input, the amount of magnetism inside the core magnet will change and thus the attraction and the repulsion of the, the magnetized iron is being done. So that movement will generate an audio output. The telephone earpiece principle, such as this one here, the magnetized diaphragm is made from iron or a magnetic alloy and is moved by the attraction or repulsion of the core as the signal current flows in the coil. The earpiece is very sensitive, although the sound quality is low. The next types are moving coil transducers. As applied to earphones, moving coil construction permits good linearity and controllable resonance. Since the amount of vibration is very small and the moving coil unit is light and can use a diaphragm of almost any suitable material. The magnets of mo modern moving coil units are invariably permanent magnets, often using quite exotic alloys. At one time, moving coil loudspeakers, known as dynamic loudspeakers, used an electromagnet to provide the magnetic field, but the vogue was short-lived because of the demands it made on the power supply of the radio receiver that used it. The next type is the ribbon loudspeaker. The moving element of a ribbon loudspeaker is necessarily small. And for that reason, the unit is usually used as a tweeter rather than a full range type. The ribbon construction offers a very directional response. The ribbon tweeter can handle frequencies from 5 kHz upwards, but a more elaborate design can allow this range to be extended down to about 1 kHz. The next type is a piezoelectric loudspeakers. 
these are also used as tweeters. And for such tweeters can be of quite high efficiency and are widely used in applications ranging from smoke detectors and computer modems. The next type is the capacitor transducers. So the advantage that makes the electrostatic loudspeaker principle so attractive is that driving effort is not applied at a point in the center of the cone or diaphragm but to the whole of the surface that can be large in the area. That is why capacitor transducers are usually of large area. There is therefore no breakup problem for the diaphragm since all parts of the diaphragm are driven by the driving effort of the circuit. And so a single unit can handle the whole of the audio range. The possibility of constructing earphones or loudspeakers along the lines of a capacitor microphone has existed for a long time, but practical difficulties have been resolved by only two designs, which is the quad and the magna planar electrostatic loudspeaker. So this is the um, illustration of a magna planar electrostatic loudspeaker principle. So the signal voltage applied to the conducting diaphragm will provide charge. And the action of the field provided by the static metal mesh on each side, which is a mesh, will move the diaphragm. So the construction is we have two meshes and then in between is the diaphragm. The important feature is that the whole diaphragm, not simply a small portion, is acted on, hence there is no breakup effect. And this is an example of the magna planar electrostatic loudspeaker. Now let's go to the ultrasonic transducers. For, for ultrasonic signals sent through the air, the transducers are used with diaphragms and in enclosures that can make the application more specialized. So that a transmitter or a receiver unit has to be used for its specific purpose. The important ultrasonic transducers are all piezoelectric or magnetostrictive because this type of transducers make use of vibration in the bulk of the material. These magnetostricting materials are materials that changes its shape whenever a magnetism is present on its material. A magnetostrictive transducer consists of a magnetostrictive metal core on which is wound a coil, such as this one. So right in the core is the magnetostrictive material, and this is the coil wrapped around it. The electrical waveform is applied to the coil, whose inductance is usually fairly high, so restricting the use of the system to the lower ultrasonic frequencies. For a large enough driving current, the core magnetostriction will cause vibration. As I've said earlier, uh, magnetostrictive materials changes its shapes or changes, changes its dimension depending on the amount of magnetism present on the material itself. And this will be considerably intensified if, if the size of the core is such that mechanical resonance is achieved. The main use of magnetostrictive transducers have been in ultrasonic cleaning baths as used by watchmakers and in electronics industry. So this type of cleaner uses ultrasonic frequency to agitate the water and that agitation will cause a vibration in the water molecules and that vibration will clean the materials that is being soaked in it. So it will um, 
clean even the smallest of the residues in the material. That is why it is being used for jewelries and watch making. The main applications of piezoelectric transducers are in security devices and signal processing. An ultrasonic transmitter in air can fill a space or a room or any yard with a standing wave pattern and a receiver can detect any change in that pattern that will be caused by any new object in that area or the room. So it is, ve it is very useful in motion detection system for security purposes. For signal processing, a radio frequency signal can be converted to an ultrasonic signal by one transducer and converted back by another using the ultrasonic wave pattern, usually in a solid such as glass to create a delay. And lastly, the infrasound. The vibrations of the earth that are accompanied by earthquakes are in a very low frequency region and it is termed as seismic waves. Transducers for seismic waves must be capable of very low frequency response which rules out the use of piezoelectric transducers because those are used at high frequencies. The principle here is that um, the vibration of the earth will move the casing, such as this one. It will move the casing, leaving the suspended mass at rest. And the relative motion after the vibration of the earth between the supports and the mass will produce the output. This mass will move and then it will produce an output voltage depending on the movement. 